I'm Robin Smith, CEO of a company called NeoSTEM. Seven years ago, we were on the bulletin board. We uplisted to the American Stock Exchange. Then we went on to the New York Stock Exchange and then into NASDAQ. Over the last seven years, we've raised over $140 million, successfully completed five M&A transactions and one divestiture. So while I have a little bit of scars, I can say that I'm living proof that if you have great technology with a strong IP portfolio, you can get cell therapies and stem cell therapies financed to bring them through development. So today's panel is called Capital Formation Strategies for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Companies. And it was formulated to discuss different ways to achieve success in the industry. And we have on the panel two esteemed analysts and two executives from companies in the sector that have very exciting technologies. I'll begin by introducing each panelist, after which each individual will share with you some of their views on the topics. We'll follow this with some Q&A, and then we'll ask you in the audience to come and engage, be part of the panel, and ask questions. So let's begin by introducing today's conference chairperson, Henry McCusker. Henry McCusker enters his 12th year as Skimeter's Regenerative Medicine Investors as an analyst, journalist, and publisher. Henry was Senior Vice President of Curis after spending 16 years focusing on healthcare investments at H&Q, which is now Tecla Capital Management. He also founded Life Science Economics, a research and analytics firm with offices in Boston and Palo Alto, California. Past experiences include Thermo Scientific, SWEC following five years at the FBI. And if that's not enough, Henry was former military officer and adjunct professor at Boston University and Golden Gate University, where he taught courses in venture capital, corporate finance, strategic development in universities at their graduate business schools. Henry, why don't you say a few words and then I'll introduce the other panelists. I think I'm gonna go back to what I said this morning when we first started. The biggest challenge to the STEM cell therapy regenerative medicine companies at this point in time is visibility. Okay, it comes down to what is happening in those capital markets. Yes, I will agree, as will other compatriots on this stage, that you know, approximately past July 1st, 70 finances. But it's still a tough year for 2013. Okay, 2012 was even tougher. But 2014, I believe, is going to be a great year for clinical data. Okay, so many of the companies are coming forth with finalizing phase three data, and I think a lot of this will truly create the focus where Pharma will finally step up and partner. So Matt Vincent joined ACT in 2011 as Director of Corporate Development, having worked as outside counsel for intellectual property, and then as a business development consultant for the company since 2005. Dr. Vincent has 21 years of relevant experience in life science industries, ranging from intellectual property strategy and patent litigation to strategic partnering and collaborations, as well as regulatory fear, affairs and clinical trial management. Dr. Vincent holds a BS in chemistry from Worcester Polytech Institute, a PhD in biochemistry from Tufts University School of Medicine, and a JD from Suffolk University School of Law. He holds several patents and has co-founded a number of life science companies, one of which has FDA, FDA approval um, product in the diagnostic space, another of which is currently conducting human clinical trials with RNA interference and agents. Matt? Um, so, I, you know, I think as, we, as I approach this panel, uh, probably the right finance person for my company is sitting in on the audience, Ted Miles, our CFO. Um, instead, I, I thought, you know, what would be the message um, you know, in terms of, of how we have to approach some of the um, back office pieces to, to financing as a, as a publicly traded company. Um, we, are, um, we are a publicly traded company. We have, uh, um, you know, in, in a space now that's um, created a tremendous amount of excitement in the investing community, um, particularly in the retail investor space, but, but growingly in the, uh, uh, in the institutional investment investor space as well. Um, for instance, we have 50,000 shareholders, retail shareholders. Um, 
you know, but, but one of the challenges in uh, at least public finance of, of regenerative medicine companies is balancing the excitement, keeping the excitement, um, with being realistic and being strategic in what you need to accomplish as a company. And that's often, you know, can be very, you know, kind of competing interests in, um, in what might motivate you to, uh, to, to take particular routes. Um, let me give you a couple examples. In the case of being realistic, you know, you know, a lot of, of our shareholders, you know, would want to see our clinical trials done already and actually are, you know, ready for us to start our pivotal studies. We're in phase one right now. Um, and, you know, we need to be realistic with regard to what the length of the regulatory process is. So I think that, again, that's a challenge in dealing with the, with the finances, um, particularly of a publicly traded company. With regard to being strategic, um, you know, we, we get asked all the time. You know, it's an exciting field that we're in. We're actually, our clinical trials relate to treating different forms of macular degeneration, including dry AMD. Um, why haven't you partnered this yet? Where's the term sheet? Um, and and it, it, again, it comes down to uh, being strategic, understanding where those inflection points of, of value are, um, what risk there is to us to complete phase one versus what's in the cost of completing phase one, and what's the upside, what's the inflection point on the other side of that in terms of value. So again, it's, it's managing the speed and, and expectation of your, uh, of your shareholder base that way as well. Um, you know, the trial designs also um, play into your financing strategy and, and kind of uh, not so subtle ways when you stop and think about them. Um, thinking about your endpoints and um, the, uh, the indications that you go after, the inclusion criteria, they all relate then to the final label that's on your product, um, which when you get to the institutional investors and you start to pick up analyst coverage, they're very sophisticated in how they view those type of issues long term. So again, you've got to be thoughtful in, uh, in, your, in your clinical studies and your clinical designs um, and not just react to whatever the current market uh, share shareholder trend might be. Um, it's also thinking about the secondary data that you might need when it comes to pricing and reimbursement. So again, designing those strategies um, in a way that, that might not always make your shareholder base happy in terms of how fast you're gonna get through them, but at the end of the day, they really are the right, the right approach. And then beyond that, at a very global level, are kind of the enterprise concerns that you have to manage against all of the, uh, the, 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 the pressure from, from, particularly from retail shareholders who are so excited about this, is thinking about your formulation, your, your distribution channels, um, you know, how you're going to penetrate the market, how you, the ease of use of your products. Because again, you have to go back and think about those very early on in your product development process, even though you might not face them until you get to phase three or beyond. Uh, but they're, they're, they're things that you have, to, you have to be mindful of now as you, as you move forward and um, are clearly going to be looked at by the analysts as they look at companies even in phase one. Great. Thank you, Matt. Dr. Chris Aries has a biomedical PhD and extensive experience with emerging companies and the challenges that face them, including financing and the regulatory approval process. He's guided company operations through startup into the clinical development phase of several therapeutic candidates, including a phase three treatment for metastatic melanoma. Currently, he's helping to position California stem cell as a leader in cell-based therapeutics. Chris? Thank you. Um, I think Matt said uh, much of what I might have said, but uh, I echo a lot of those sentiments, uh, certainly in terms of uh, managing expectations of investors and the challenges that that brings to uh, uh, anybody doing therapeutic development, but especially in a space like this that's uh, uh, a new and emerging sector of the uh, biomedical research space. So uh, people, and we're completely uh, angel funded at this point, but uh, people have different event horizons and different time frames that they want to see return on investment. So being very careful that you, uh, you deliver on what you promise and you manage the expectations of those people is, uh, is very important. We're an early stage company. Um, we've been around for about seven years developing technologies for uh, uh, replacement of motor neurons lost in diseases of the central nervous system. And uh, most recently, uh, we have a phase three approval for metastatic melanoma. That's an immunotherapy we're very excited about. And uh, you know, as we move through the planning process of that and try to, uh, try to get a handle on the, the time frame of the clinical trials, the, uh, you know, what is the reimbursement path, as Matt says, et cetera, it is uh, definitely a challenge to manage the expectations of private investors and uh, is definitely one that we'll be looking forward to uh, as our investor base grows moving forward. 
Steve Brozak is the president of WBB Securities and supervises its research as well as banking operations. Both the Wall Street Journal, FactSet, and the FT Starmine have ranked him as a top analyst in biotechnology, healthcare equipment, and pharmaceutical industry for the last four years. Steve is a frequent speaker in the media, a Forbes commentator, and at industry gatherings such as today. He's also a retired U.S. Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel and now serves on the Secretary of Navy's Retiree Council, where he focuses on health care issues for the military. Steve holds a BA and MBA from Columbia University, and similar to Henry, is a trusted friend and advisor to many companies in our sector. Steve, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to go back 10 years, uh, uh, being back here in Boston, and I'd just gotten out of the Marine Corps, or I was just getting out of the Marine Corps, and um, the government didn't realize how big a problem they had in the Middle East. And I wrote a report about it, uh, and they basically didn't think too much of my report, so I figured it was probably time for me to retire. And unfortunately, being an analyst there was much easier than being an analyst on Wall Street. So fast forward a couple years, and they realized they had to not just bulk up on people, but they had to spend a whole lot of money. So um, I like to think that what I do as an analyst is go out there and handicap things. And frankly, in this space, in the past, it's been pretty easy to bet against things. Now, I'm sure you guys are all aware that we have a little bit of a difficulty down in DC. And uh, the Boston Herald, I was going to take the New York Post because they're usually a little bit more flamboyant. But I think the title here is uh, Shut Down, Stare Down, right? So you got a picture right over here and, you know, it's about perception. And today, everyone understands that our healthcare uh, system, systems, is broken. Um, but for the first time, I really like the odds. And I really like the odds because when a government organization down in DC schedules a meeting where they invite a large number of pharmaceutical entities, and the title of the meeting is, how do we save large pharma, and these reps actually show up, you know that there's a difficulty and you know that it's been acknowledged. So for the first time, I like the odds because even though we're now in a situation where the government is saying we have to stop spending, they understand that in order to save money, they're going to have to start spending. And that cumulative effect is something where I now, for the first time, really do like the odds. Because I will end on this note. Science is scientific. And that means that discovery, planning, everything else is usually random. And that means that any project that is actually put together well, a large number of times will have an unexpected outcome. And if you can find that unexpected outcome, that's what investors really like to see because it gives them a sense that, guess what? We have something new. It may be different, but we have something new. And that really probably is the only answer that we can start to pose for how are we going to stop spending as much and how are we going to get off this pill a day mentality? Robert. Great. So maybe we can get into some more uh, detailed and specifics. So maybe we'll start with you, Steve. What do you feel are some creative solutions to finance a therapeutic pipeline? Okay. I just mentioned the United States government. Um, HHS through <coughs> NIH, NIAID, BARDA, they all have uh, proposals that you can basically file for. They all have submission requirements. They all have government grants, as a matter of fact. Uh, Neostem is the beneficiary of such government grants. These aren't just sources of money. These are also validating sources of money. Someone sees it and, you know, I'd like to tell you that all the institutions I deal with, you know, are really that sharp. But a lot of the times they're just too damn busy. They just can't do all the due diligence. And if they see NIH, NIAID, if they see someone going out there and vouchsafing for a program, that gives them some sense of security. And that allows them to then leverage and say, well, if these people are putting money into it and they've done the due diligence, due diligence why shouldn't we? And especially at these prices. So I'd say that's one of the initial creative items that I would say to you would probably jump off the page right now. Chris, any thoughts? 
Coming from the, coming from the uh, point of view of a, a small company in uh, early stage development, we had to be uh, you know, very stage specific in terms of financing the company growth. And I think it's uh, something that most young companies have gone through, but uh, in early stages, you're going after you know, in individual investors, typically um, trying to leverage as many different sources of revenue or income as you can. Grant uh, possibilities are definitely uh, very attractive at that point, and uh, as Steve says, they validate and give people confidence in your programs. We've also worked extensively with uh, family foundations and groups with interests in the particular disease areas that we've uh, been approaching and uh, tried to leverage the resources and uh, the donor base of those to help to fund the development of the therapeutic programs that we're working on. Um, as we move forward, and develop technologies that can be out licensed. We, uh, you know, have obviously taken advantage of those opportunities, and then the company starts to grow and get bigger, and programs become more advanced. You need to divest yourself of some of those things that distract you, and so out licensing those things or partnering those things that aren't the core company focus becomes important. And as you get into later stage development, then of course you can uh, attract more investment and bigger institutional investors with uh, more advanced programs and partnership opportunities. Great. Um, Matt? Add two quick things to that. Um, you know, on the issue of credibility, um, it's looking at your portfolio and, and seeing if there are opportunities of, for partnering at a very small scale. You know, if you have cells that might be useful to a company in screening, um, doing it in a way that allows you to take some of the money that comes into that and advance your cell therapy programs. I mean, that's one of the things to look at, where you start to build credibility in the investor community that you're doing deals with big pharma companies, even if you're not ready to do the big deal yet. Um, the other thing that, just to, to mention, I don't know that any of us are ready for this yet, but a lot of the royalty buying companies, the royalty pharma, the DRIs of the world, are actually now starting to reach back into products before they're even approved products. Um, they often will look at now phase two assets and uh, will buy out part of the royalty rate um, as a you know kind of a designated use of funds. But they're you know they are putting their money in not as a equity investment but as a royalty play even before the drug is approved. And I think it's only a matter of time, particularly for some of the bigger markets that companies here are addressing, before you start to see those type of royalty buy, those royalty opportunities come in as an alternative to an equity or a debt financing. So a street, another strategic way to get a partner at the back end. So other two uh, creative solutions to think about is partnering with not-for-profits, the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation and some of the other um, foundations that are focused on disease states can certainly help advance some of the clinical trials and some of the R&D work. And also a revenue side of the business. That certainly is a way to help underwrite the internal clinical development. Very often in the past, I think Wall Street didn't really like both the service side of the business and their own internal development, had trouble uh, valuing those type of companies. Companies, but we're finding now there's more interest in having that. It's almost looked as a hedge, if you will, to have that service revenues help underwrite um, some of the internal development. Robin. Robin, if I can jump in. Uh, and not to plug you, but you know there are very few companies where you can go out there and see in the regenerative medicine space where you actually can say, okay, is it a one bet all or is it a diversified play? And one of the advantages of Neostem is that they do have manufacturing as well as uh, the ability to advance projects both for themselves and for others. So those are hedges that uh, mean a lot, not just for uh, different government grants, but also for other institutional investors. And there is one group that I'll say that for the first time I've started to take them seriously, and I'm sure. Everybody in this room can identify a hospital center that's got some hedge fund manager whose name is attached to it now, right? Well, the reality is, I remember a conversation about, I don't know, five, six years ago when I was talking to one of these guys, and um, I was explaining to him how, you know, this was really important because you were talking about a cardiac indication that could easily be proven. And the person said to me, well, you know, I'm a John Deere kind of guy, and my quick answer was, oh, so what you're telling me is that you're immune to aging. And at that point, he laughed and said, well, what do you want me to do? You know, have you become my personal investor for my health care? And I said, no, we'd probably not work that thing out. But uh, about three years later, he bought a hospital, or he had a hospital system named after him. I'm not going to tell you which hedge fund manager it is. But um, we're now starting to see that these people that have significant currency are actually starting to put it to use. And families that understand 
that this is a situation where monopolies can be developed are starting to become very interesting. And I think you'll probably see that kind of trend going forward into the very near future. Great. Thanks, Steve. So both Matt and Chris mentioned partnerships. So maybe, Henry, you could start by talking about some of the important considerations to look for as people are looking for partnerships for their therapeutic pipeline. I look back historically, having been on the corporate side and also been on the venture side for almost 17 years, and you would always have the opportunity to participate if a company you had invested was considering a corporate partnership. But one of the things I always thought from the beginning was what was the culture of the personalities involved? And I could see a number of companies where, oh, it could have been a good deal, there was a structure, and science was correct, but the personalities just didn't get along, and the culture was quite different um, in those sort of times. The question came down to, well, where was the vision? What was the comparable vision, as far as I was concerned? Again, then, um, as people step forward, I think, is that what are the milestones and catalysts that will feed this continued development? Okay, and on top of that, the bottom line is does it equal what cash issues are involved for each milestone and catalyst? And yet, then you've seen the issues of things that have worked for a period of time, and then just sort of people have walked away. What's very interesting in these past year, and just in itself, there is the sort of the usage of the option loan that they will put in a, a bit of money. They will take a percentage there. There's truly only an option. There's not a full collaboration of something that had been considered years ago when we were doing deals. In fact, you used to do the legal work at the time. But um, I think that's one of the important things. First of all, is the culture and the personality. And Matt, you talked a little bit about how these partnerships can be both validating and sources of finance. Maybe you can elaborate a little more? Yeah, no, I think, um, again, wearing the, the, the fortunate hat right now of having clinical products, this is a question we ask ourselves all the time. You know, for me, it's not a matter of if, it's going to be a matter of when. And really, it comes down to balancing the, um, the value of the deal by getting further into your trials against the likelihood of success that you can get by bringing a big pharma company and all of what they can bring to bear that much earlier. Now, I already mentioned this earlier because I think it's so important to be able to address very early in your product development um, process, you know, having a, a, a pharma company that has not only ex extensive experiment experience with the US FDA and the European EMA, but you know, perhaps with multiple other regulatory agencies around the world, um, is tremendously valuable. Uh, tremendously valuable in thinking about um, your clinical designs for phase two and phase three studies and beyond. Um, having a, again, an organization like that behind you early on that's considering the reimbursement and pricing strategy with you. Um, oftentimes little companies don't have that type of, type of bandwidth. And we look to consultants, but that's built in often in these big pharma companies. Um, and then beyond that, it's also the manufacturing and other CMC issues, the formulation, you know, the final product definition that really can, can lead to um, that, a that much more successful product, or in some cases, no product if you're not careful with it, that you get by getting that bandwidth. So I think that for a lot of companies, that's going to be the struggle. And again, it's also managing the expectation of investors of, you know, do you do a deal with that phase one, or do you get to the end of phase one? If you can, if anyone's even interested at the end of phase one, check the box so you de-risk that, or, you know, do you keep going? You know, what is the risk to you to getting through phase two? Or now maybe the value goes up another 10x, so. Any other comments on partnerships that anyone would like to add? I think I'd add to one more. Um, recently, I was involved in a major corporate partnership that did not take place Everybody was happy. They were going down to the final fourth or fifth and even eighth copy of what it should be. And suddenly it broke apart. Okay, and some part of the issues were the different culture, the culture of the new company who wanted to partner with them. 
in the culture of the old company. The old company, excuse me, the new company who wanted to partner okay, with the larger company had an issue because they have an old line thought process of that the partner should pay for the clinical trials. Okay, in these new days, it's more of a sharing sequence of those clinical trial costs in many cases. Um, the other came down to who is actually going to manufacture the product for the trials into later. And there was a question come down to that where they wanted to maintain the manufacturing rights, but they might have been willing to put it up. But suddenly there, been, there were so many factors and there was so much word out in the, in the, the sort of quote unquote universe or in the air that the deal didn't get done, okay? And it just, again, came down to, I believe at the time, was the personalities of old line thinking versus new line thinking of you know, what do we have to do? And pharma traditionally still doesn't understand cell therapy. Stephen and I have had this thing, how many times have we talked about it, as, as Robin as well, they just don't understand what it is at the moment, although they have a particular interest because the first person who hits the gong bell is going to have a great deal, okay, at this point in time. So it but sounds like you're saying shared risk is more of the future the than risk. the past. So as we've all seen, you mentioned 70 deals have gotten done and are very optimistic about 2014. But over the years, the equity markets certainly have waxed and waned. Maybe you could each talk about, uh, maybe we'll start with Steve, how companies should be looking at debt financing versus equity financing to fund their cell therapy products. Okay. Um, I'll start with the disclaimer, not all debt is created equal. As, uh, you know, as everyone knows, there are some lenders that are, are really phenomenal, and there are other lenders that make more money if you can't pay them back. So, you know, the street understands that. The street knows what the reputations of each of the lenders has. And on the other side, um, I look at it as a leverageable event, because if you're taking in somebody's, if you're taking in money, certainly in, the, in these times right now, the lenders understand that the equity markets have been roaring hot, so they have to be ultra competitive in terms of what they're offering, and especially the best ones, because they're going out there and you know they're they're getting pretty much rock bottom uh, terms as far as the um, people that are borrowing the money. So if you can get a lender, a good lender, to get you money, it becomes an automatic twofer. Because people do have, institutional investors do have that herd mentality. And uh, this is one where if an institution that has the bona fides of being a good lender is actually putting money towards a regenerative medicine company, people pay attention to that. Everyone understands that you can do a deal, you can do several different kinds of financing deals. But if you can get a debt deal done, that speaks of volumes and other people will definitely pay attention to that. Henry, what's your view of debt versus equity? I think there's multiple forms of debt um, at the moment. I mean, a lot of people look at the combination of um, some of these banks like Silicon Valley Bank who partner up with GE Healthcare, or partner up with someone else. And you have the question of A, you get the cash. Hey, we all need the cash, we need to advance our development cycles. Um, however, there's another element of the debt cycle, and if you can get it, it's great. But at the same time, you're sooner or later gonna have to pay it back in one form or another, because that in one sense, it is reducing, okay, the viability of your share price. But the other point is, is an, I think an overuse um, of ATMs lately, where these companies set up these deals with Lincoln Park or Aspire, uh, you know, a couple of the other names, and, and they are appropriate vehicles at the time. But if you, uh, let's just take company X, that Steve and I discuss all the time, but company X, and if you look at the issue of, and of how much of those by borrowing against the shares, that company has acquired a huge amount of their shares under an ATM program. 
But don't forget, the ATM is for them to sell those shares to the future, which is going to, again, lower that stock price. So it might be good for today, but it ain't good for tomorrow, as far as I'm concerned. Any view from the company side of how you're looking at ATMs or debt finances? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think the reality is if you're a company that, that's trying to raise capital, you know, ATMs may be the way that you go. But I would say this, if you're looking at the debt side, unless you're dealing with the merchant banks, I think one of the things to be careful of is what's happening in the venture capital community right now. One of the trends is for the conversation to begin where it looks like debt. Um, and all of the best terms of debt, and before you know it, then it's become an equity deal and a debt deal, and now you get, they've, they've negotiated all of the um, safety of the debt and all of the upside of the equity in one deal, and, and, and haven't taken the risk by distinguishing those. So I think you just, you do have to, um, if, you, if you're picking who you're going to borrow from, just be mindful that um, you know, there is a trend out there right now. Not, nothing that we've done, but it's something I've seen with friends of mine who are in other companies have dealt with this issue of, of, uh, of finding themselves having gone far down the road and now looking at a deal that, that they probably wish they had started with an equity deal instead. If I, if I can jump in, I, I'm really shocked, simply shocked that a bank would play bait and switch on a company. I mean, you know, is this possible? <laughs> or our or, or lender would do that? I mean, come on. You know, what, what, what are we talking about? You're winning, sir? Come on. Uh, but when I mentioned before, the quality of the lender, the quality of the investor is absolutely critical because you are in a situation where the perception of something that is really good, all of a sudden when someone doesn't take more than five minutes to read an Edgar, then all of a sudden you've got something that's saying, all right, explain what is is, and then you've got something that was stone cold debt, and now there's a pollution clause in here, and oh, by the way, you've got to meet all these endpoints. So again, it's that selectivity part that basically means all the difference. Yeah, but Steve, what about the issues of if you create a debt and you, and you have that instrument, and you have a factor of what you have to pay that debt, and next thing you know, a, a one of the lenders is assessing a warrant, okay? Another one is assessing a unit to it. So it sort of becomes a complicated process as you try to unravel the true value of what they're really trying to do. Hey, if I'm an analyst and it takes me more than like 30, 40, 50 seconds to figure out, you know, what the terms are, then, you know, we're now probably into some gray area where think about what the investors are gonna be thinking about. So you really, want to make sure that in these cases, if there are warrants, in some cases they are, they are you know, appropriate, but you want to make sure that the warrants are at a much higher price, and you want to make sure that every shareholder benefits from the fact that the prices are going up. That's what investors, that's what institutions critically look for. And any person that's putting money in that doesn't have that understanding, you probably don't want their money in the first place. And certainly if you have a near-term catalyst, it's a way to get there, um, sort of topping up the, the bank accounts to be sure you can get there and it can signal that you're very bullish about where you think that milestone is going to take the stock. Yeah, and, and it, many a time, I've, I've even written debt transactions where it's based on more money coming in at a higher price based on a, uh, a positive catalyst because all of a sudden now the institution realizes, hey, I got a great deal before, but I'm getting an even better deal now, and the company has got this money that's going to be able to increase the speed of the trial or increase the speed of whatever they're doing, and it's going to validate it even more. So you've mentioned as creative solutions, um, state and federal government money, a way a money that doesn't have to be given back. So maybe we could talk in a little more specifics and share with the audience. Maybe we could start with Chris and then Steve, you want to talk a little bit more detail of what's really out there to help people advance their pipelines. There's been uh, a lot of talk about, uh, in my state, California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Um, that's an example of uh, something that was created to try and stimulate the industry as a whole and uh, in a time when uh, funding in the rest of the country uh, at least initially was not uh, to be had very easily for a wide range of stem cell products and uh, so it was uh, catalytic in a way it brought a lot of industry to the state and, and uh, quite a few academic researchers and not so many companies have uh, benefited from that um, catalyst 
Um, they've actually moved now to a, a big debt component as well, so it's not just grant money that's being handed out in these uh, cases. These are, are uh, loans essentially from the state government uh, that may or may not be forgiven depending on how the programs work out. And they have a variety of different uh, clawback mechanisms to try to, uh, to de-risk the investment that they're looking at. Um, similarly, there's, uh, there's venture philanthropy type uh, programs where, uh, you know, family organizations or organizations that are charitable foundations are funding in exchange for equity in the company. So um, I would say that grants are not all created equal and that's something that has to be looked at uh, and evaluated whether or not these uh, are attractive enough to, attra uh, to warrant uh, taking them. I uh, would probably say that one of the hallmarks of all the stuff that we've heard about as far as government spending has been the term dual use. If the government can go out there and say, if we spend money on this, if we go out there and we put money behind this research or behind this clinical development to get a product, is it just for one thing? I mean, how many different ways can you have an anthrax vaccine, okay? Now, if you're looking at improving vaccine technology, that's something else. If you're looking at basically dealing with an antibiotic, that's something else. If you're looking at just a stone cold defense system, it's got limited applications. However, this is the real hallmark behind regenerative medicine. If you advance one thing, you've now opened it up to something that is completely different. And this is where I believe the government is starting to look and say, okay, these people get paid a certain amount, it's public record. What they're looking for is a way to advance science and also to provide a legacy by what they're doing. And I think that, you know, you've got a coterie of companies and what they look for, they look for are established companies that understand how to do financial reporting, that they understand how to do manufacturing, and frankly, that they also understand how to deal with the regulatory process, which we're gonna get into later. Because these are all items where you basically have to say, does this company have the wherewithal, not only to go after the science, but also to be there at the end of the day. And I think that's an important consideration that all of these government programs really are starting to really seriously consider now. So if you receive NIH funding, SBIR funding, DOD, do you think that's a validating for, for a company to, to be able to receive those kinds of funds? Is that part of a, of a way to look at a company's value? And, and uh, I think that two parts of it uh, come to, uh, come to uh, fruition right now. The first one is, that in these quote unquote restrictive times when at least the perception is there, it's absolutely accretive. And two, for the first time, the government is actually pulling monies back. <laughs> They're saying, no, we don't like what you're doing, or no, you haven't met your endpoints, that's it, game over. And they're shuttling those funds to programs that they believe are more efficacious. So it is actually an even greater validation. If you can keep a program, if you can advance a program, if you can go out there and show a dual purpose, the rewards, I believe, in the near future will be very, very significant. So I agree. I mean, I've, if basically it's non dilutive you agree? cash. I think, there's, I think there's a spectrum across the two, though. I think, I think the NIH, the SBIR, the SDTR type grants, you know, you get, I think, probably more value out of the fact that it's non dilutive than maybe perhaps the credibility. By the time you're hitting BARDA, A firm, and that type of funding, those government organizations have said we're not funding research and development, we're funding the, the final steps in manufacturing. That they've actually believe in your process, even if you still have clinical trials left um, in your, you know, on your to-do list, um, they've now validated a product pipeline or product portfolio that, um, that has, you know, not only it, the uh, expectation that you'll reach licensure for um, a use that, that could be used in disaster preparedness, but they also believe that you have a business that's going to be ongoing. In the case of BARDA, they fund programs with the expectation that you will have a commercial market that will sustain your company and that you will either have um, uh, you know, surge capacity or you will have um, the ability to, uh, uh, to bank materials in case of, a, of case of disaster preparedness. So I, so I think when you get to those type of, of big contracts, you're looking at something that's not only non-dilutive, but now you have um, a lot more uh, credibility around um, the, 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 the risk of where you are to find a licensure of a product. But they're also mildest and 
catalyst space. You've got to go to X to get Y, to Y to get Z. Okay, and you've got to meet those milestones or basically the spigot got shut off. Don't, don't you agree, Steve? Yeah. Um, I believe that BART is a great example. Um, you know, now, you've got to remember, BART basically can fund a phase one. They can go out there and they, you got a phase one done, safety, that's within their mandate. They were created specifically to address the, the, the valley of death, as they call it. And, you know, under the different guidelines of the animal rule, they can do a lot of things in their mandate. But the reality is this, once you get on that radar screen, other people look and they say, you know, we have an interest. And, you know, it's a horrific thing to understand that we've been at war now for 10 years, okay? 10 years of people that have basically have been coming off the, the battlefield that are, frankly, in the worst shape that they've ever been. How do you think these people are going to basically be dealt with in years to come? Regenerative medicine is probably the only viable example other than palliative care. And a lot of different government agencies are paying attention to that because they understand that if they're going to go out there and spend their money, this is something that is truly different and it's possibly a one-time or a two-time fix-it. So it's a way to improve clinical outcomes and lower overall health care costs. Exactly. So given that there's such a disparity between market caps of companies, and as a whole, I think we all would agree that the cell therapy space as an aggregate is a low, low value compared to where it should be, maybe we can hear from the analysts. We can start with Henry. How do you feel companies should actually be valued in this space? Unfortunately, at the moment, um, the true way to value a company is basically on the basis of market comparable. I mean, that's what investors are looking at at the moment. Can you use a discounted cash flow focus to the future? I believe not. Um, so basically, it's on a, on a market basis. But again, it's, it's a, there are no true fundamentals as you look at what's existing now. However, what's driving, and you've experienced this, what's driving is solid, credible, news will drive momentum, okay? And that momentum will express higher share price, okay? At which point you're, you're leaving behind the potential of the, the sort of retail or individual investor who now have put you onto the long-term or larger fund, and even the hedge fund radar screen which is helpful in some ways because if you can get the long funds to start taking, as I call it, the taste, okay, and that they will build to it, but at the same time you have the issues of the hedge funds and those short players who can take you up and also within minutes, you know, sometimes days, even weeks, take you down, okay? Um, but again, I think the market is just it's there, it's what it is, and just have to accept it and understand it and use it to your best advantage. Steve? Okay, how many people here know Celgene Corporation? I better see everybody raise their hand, okay? Because you're asleep if, if I, I, all right. I covered them back in 1998 when they were a $100 million market cap company. And then all of a sudden a paper came out talking about multiple monoloma and within probably six months, they were a $1 billion market cap on, on the way to a $65 billion market cap today. And they do have a stem cell uh, division within the company. You know, you want to tell me that the markets are efficient? I, I can, you know, I'm an analyst. I can find many reasons when they are not. They're not efficient. However, they do respond to, the, they do respond to stimulus. Now, it's got to be the correct stimulus. So if a CEO goes out there and continues to make positive announcements, and if they should happen to be accretive and unexpected, even better, because that's one thing that investors really want. They want to be surprised on the upside. If you can continuously surprise them with something where they're picking up a paper that's not related to something that an analyst has written, and they see your name on the front page, that makes their day. And the sentiment can start very, very quickly. And then all of a sudden you have a situation where problems start to solve themselves. 
And that's something that you should understand very, very keenly, that the perception of success really begets success sometimes. And it can be something as simple as explaining something in a different way and also making sure that people understand what you're talking about. So do you think the regulatory environment affects investors and their appetite to fund early stage technologies? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, definitely. It, it's the number one, uh, you know, people say, well, you know, how are you going to get through the agency? Well, a lot of companies, and this is where, you know, you want to look at the companies and see who do they have that was from the agency? Because when the agency's people say, we suggest that you do this, that's not a suggestion. That means if you don't do it, you're not going to get approval, no way in hell, okay? So you got to understand that there's, there's FDA speak. And if you see that a company has representation that is from FDA, that's another validating vouchsafing moment where all of a sudden you've got someone that understands, okay, it's not, it's not like they're going to go out there and get preferential treatment, but they, they speak the language. So all of a sudden now you've got a situation where you've got a head start right off the bat. I can remember putting my first IND together. Okay, and this was in, I think it was 1989, 1990 maybe. It was a pad that was six foot high and would shrink wrap. Okay, now it's a little book. And what did we have for guidance and direction? Not much. Now, again, you've had these credible sources, you have the right people, you have CROs. We had a CRO. But that's, it's, a, it's a whole different ballgame now. Chris or Matt, any thoughts? You know, I think I, I, th I think when you look at the uh, the regulatory pathway right now, and it, and it, and it, and it, and it is Broke. still shifting. Um, I, I think it becomes um, you know a uh, probably you know, I, honestly the biggest risk factor. I mean, I'm stating the obvious that everyone everyone considers in, in their investment. Um, there, there have been a couple of successes, though, over the over the last few years that I think have uh, have started to to shift some of the way that folks look at those risks. And I think that um, they haven't necessarily come in the form of approved products, um, but rather the FDA simply allowing products to begin clinical trials. I mean, I know when I look at our own case um, and Giron at the same time, getting an embryonic stem cell product approved for phase one was a big unknown. I mean, up until that point that that happened, I think the, there was a, a, a big question out there as to you know, how the regulators were ultimately going to react to that type of product. And, and I think it paved the way then to start looking at IPS and other pluripotent stem cell sources as well as, and I think the adult stem cells so before that helped, but to start to look at things that you know, have potentially similar risk profiles and now start to believe that there is a regulatory path that can be followed. Um, I think, you know, prior to, you know, first Giron and then, and then us getting, getting to that phase one approval, I think you would have had to put a big question mark around the IPS technology that's out there as well. Um, so, it, it, you know, obviously there, there still is a tremendous amount of risk, but I also think there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, opportunity um, in terms of dialogue that the FDA is willing to have, probably more so with regenerative medicine products than, than, the, than the average small molecule, for example, or, or, or protein biologic um, intended for, for, for palliative care. So, you know, it's a, maybe a long-winded way of saying it's, it, well, it's still risky. I think that there, uh, I think that the, the, the uh, table has been set to believe that there really is a path to licensure. We echo the uh, sentiments that the uh, the path, uh, the trail has been blazed to some extent at this point, and uh, and the embryonic stem cell or uh, pluripotent stem cell um, regulatory uh, challenges are not seen as a huge impediment as they were five or six years ago. And uh, but we certainly did see a lot of hesitancy in the side of investors uh, back in those days with embryonic projects in particular, um, and. Uh, and navigating those paths has been uh, an interesting challenge. You know, you could still get people on board, but as an interesting, uh, you know, observation, we took on an autologous uh, cancer stem cell program a few years ago, and uh, the appetite for investment in that was vastly higher, and uh, obviously less risk of uh, being denied by FDA. So that that pathway of regulatory uh, 
uh, hurdles ahead of you certainly does uh, skew the perception of investors and make your life a lot easier if you've got something with less challenge ahead of you. So before we open questions to the audience, does anyone want to comment on what you see may be the next major catalyst to raise valuation of the industries as a whole? Clinical data. It's all about clinical data. That's the future. If you have that clinical data, you'll have partners knocking on your door. Until the time comes in understanding the actual disease application, um, it's going to sort of just go along. Um, it'll just move through. But you, once that phase three data comes in, the partnering people will think in the needle for the shares and everything else will rise because one affects the other. All you have to do is have one major company come in and do a deal with another company and the next thing you know, another company. They all start feeling that, oh, it's coming for us too. So it, it, it's like the snowball rolling downhill in my, in my book. It's what I've seen. Steven? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't even think it needs to be a phase three. I think it just needs to be a well-respected, peer-reviewed publication that goes out there and makes a statement that is reproducible, where someone comes out there and finds something, and then all of a sudden, all bets are off. That's how science, real science discovery works. And when that happens, I think all of a sudden, you're going to basically say, I want the son of, or I want number three, or I want this, and it will become that proverbial feeding frenzy. Great. To uh, say also that I think uh, on top of all of those, and clinical clinical success in an orphan disease area is is very interesting, and obviously there's going to be a lot of uh, excitement uh, both in partners and investors when that happens. But when we hit something big that affects a lot of people, and we see a clear path towards success, and I think ACT's got a good shot at something like that, um, and I think that's going to really move the needle in a very significant way. Echo the same thing everyone's heard, it's like real estate, right? Data, data, data. Um, but I would say secondary to that would be understanding from the regulator's perspective whether outcome studies are going to be required and how extensive those are going to be. I think that still ends up when you watch the cardiovascular space um, and the uh, metabolic disease space and all of the ups and downs that happen with the outcome studies. I think that, that understanding that will, on top, as a secondary to the data, will help, I think, make this field a lot more predictable and be a catalyst towards, um, you know, ultimately higher values for all of these companies and these technologies. So we have about seven minutes before the networking coffee break. You have three companies in the trenches and two esteemed analysts. Can I offer any questions that any of you may have for any of us? I'll jump in right there because, you know, uh, in stealing Robin's thunder, you know, guess where the work was done? If, uh, if, you know, Dendrion had left their work over at Neostem, we might be talking about an entirely different shape of global events because the cost of goods, the cost of manufacturing, the systems were scalable where they were. That was a business decision. So when you're talking about something where the approval took place, yes, but when you're talking about the, the business decision that took place may not have been the most sound business decision, especially since it was started, was operated, and was proven right here uh, under, under uh, Robin's watch. I think contract manufacturing gives you the ability if your sales are lumpy and you can't really necessarily know how, it's going to, how long it's going to take to hit those sales numbers, it's a way to help mitigate costs and lower the, their, your ability to get to commercialization using a contract manufacturer. Well, but you 
But that was a choice. They selected to do it on their own. They, if you use a contract manufacturer, you have multiple clients in those clean rooms with those. No, I, I, I can understand exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's business. That's the problem. Well, the industry has to grow as a whole. I think the, the cost of goods need to come down, and there needs to be more. Um, more contract manufacturers and more showing of companies that their ability to manufacture both autologous as well as allogeneic cells can be successful with a low cost of goods so that there can be profits. And a clear clinical benefit that lasts longer than four months, I think, as well. Yeah, you know, it's a good point. If you're seeing an effect, it's a five-year effect. Um, that was 93 a month. <laughs> They did, but they paved a great pathway, though, for approval, and I think we all have to commend them their ability to take a drug from early on and get approval. So, to their credit, Robin, um, there was a lot of discussion about debt financing. Uh, Mitch, could you speak up a little there bit? Is, there was a lot of discussion about debt financing. Yes. And I just want, at least from my perspective, warn you that all depends on where you are with the development. If you're too early to go for debt financing, and I know my friends venture capital always encourage you to do that, unless you're hitting a major milestone, you know with that money you're gonna hit the major milestones, it really is a kiss of death in many cases. I've seen too many companies, as, a, as a, the Henry points as the ATM machine, go there and not to be able to deliver and the subsequent equity financing becomes a major problematic for the company. So it really, you got to be really understand that you're going to pay that money back. You're going to pay it with the interest rate that probably not necessarily you're going to be happy with. But you better hit those milestones. If not, then you're going to be in trouble. So is, debt financing is not, from my perspective, is good for every startup company. You've got to be, you gotta be very selective because it may not work very well for you. I've seen too many companies close the door, go home when they could not pay back and they, were not, they did not deliver uh, what they promised they're going to deliver. They had a problem with financing their company. I, uh, I would wholeheartedly agree that debt financing is not suitable for everyone, but you've got to understand something. You know, it's a poor rule that doesn't work both ways. If you set someone's expectations up that you're going to deliver on something, you better really deliver on that thing. Because if you don't, they have an expectation too. This document says that you owe me X number of dollars. If you don't believe you basically can deliver on it within a reasonable amount of time, then you better understand that that may not be a good option for you. And frankly, most lenders will probably avoid you in the first place or put terms that are not favorable for you. So it's a two-way street. You always have to understand who you're dealing with, and you have to understand what are the chances for your success. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm Angela Cristiano. I'm from Columbia University. I work on hair growth. Um, just a quick question. Those of us in the academic setting are struggling with funding you know, night and day. This is all we do. We're also looking for creative ways to partner with regenerative medicine companies at an early stage. I think Henry mentioned the idea of an option as, as one of these new models. But I wondered how you might feel about the concept of sort of crowdfunding, uh, partnering with in university investigators very early, uh, basically when they're still uh, in their labs, and looking for ways to help us foster uh, ways to make you know, things that would be of interest to the community, uh, and if there might be some creative financing that could benefit um, you guys, us, uh, something different. I, I've known some people that basically uh, started up crowdfunding, and, and frankly, all the securities laws are stacked so that it's more complicated, it's more problematic than, you know, you really think it is. And, it, and again, it, isn't a, it, was, it, had, it was well-intentioned, but the crowdfunding really never developed. The way I would probably suggest that you would think about doing things are that each of these companies has business development departments. If you go out there and make a cogent case of how you're gonna go out there and reuse every device test tube repeatedly and save money and do it on a shoestring budget where you can actually deliver on something, 
a lot of people will actually say, yes, I remember doing this when I was a postdoc. That's an option. When you go out there and you know more about the business development person that you're dealing with at that company, you've got a legitimate shot. And that's the way I would approach it. We'd be happy to answer any more questions in the networking section. Thank you very much. Thanks.